From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is the Morning Edition. I'm Tammy Mills, filling in for Samantha Selinger-Morris. It's Tuesday, September 30. Researchers say they have, for the first time, dramatically slowed the progression of a cruel and devastating urine condition called Huntington's disease. For sufferers, this potentially means getting years of their life back or the lessening of symptoms of a condition that robs them of physical movement and kills brain cells. Today, Professor Julie Stout from Monash University's Turner Institute of Brain and Mental Health on why this clinical trial, which involved a small number of patients in London, has the medical world so excited. So Julie, welcome to the morning edition. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So first, can you tell us what Huntington's disease is and how it affects sufferers? Sure. So Huntington's disease, it's called a neurological disease because it affects the brain and the nervous system. It is a genetic disease, and in this case, it's called an autosomal dominant genetic disease. And what that means is it runs strongly in families. So how that works is that any parent who has um, the gene for Huntington's disease When they produce a child, an offspring, that child has a 50% chance of inheriting that gene. And if they inherit the gene, they'll eventually get the disease. What the disease does is it causes changes in the brain, but also throughout the body because there's actually nervous system tissue throughout the body. There are specific parts of the brain that are degenerating earlier and more severely. And those parts of the brain are really important parts because they're kind of connector parts between a lot of other parts of the brain. So that means that the effects of Huntington's disease on on behavior are pretty widespread. They affect movement. So people get these kind of uncontrollable movements. Sometimes it looks like they're maybe their arms are kind of moving around when they don't mean to or their legs might be twitching or they might have some facial movements. So that's one thing that you see. The second thing that you see is you see that they have problems with their thinking and memory. So they develop some cognitive decline and that progresses across time. And then the third part is that they develop a mood disorder like depression or anxiety um, and other kind of psychiatric manifestations. And those can really vary quite a lot from person to person. Sometimes you see sort of inappropriate behaviors like impulsive behaviors at times that being a bit out of control. And that doesn't happen to everyone, but it does happen to some people that they might have sort of temper outbursts and things like that. Mm. I've read that it's been described as like one of the most cruelest and devastating diseases. Is that correct? Well, it it is a really um, cruel disease. I'll tell you one thing that they say, and they said it on TV last week, I heard them say, it's like a combination between Parkinson's, Alzheimer's and ALS. Actually, I don't think that's really true. It's it's really its own different mm. disease and it has different characteristics. So it it is a devastating disease. But I'll tell you what I think is the most devastating thing about it probably is the fact that it can, uh, it usually has onset um, when people are sort of in their middle, uh, the middle of their lives. So it can actually have onset any time from childhood to old age, but the most common ages of onset are usually sort of the 30s and 40s. And so having uh, a disease that causes cognitive decline um, and psychiatric symptoms and even the movement disorder at that young age means that people, you know, they usually have their families around that time or before that time. So they might have young children. They are working. Maybe they're in kind of the ascending part of their career where things are building up for them. Um, and so to be affected by a disease that that begins to take away some of your abilities. Um, it happens very gradually, by the way, but it does begin to take away some of your abilities at that, you know, at that younger age, I think is even more devastating. And how widespread is it in Australia? Well, it's interesting that we don't know exactly because we've never had a prevalence study to look at it across the entire country. So that's, a, there is an attempt right now. But from what we can gather from the existing records, we think that possibly there might be 10,000 people affected if you include the people who have the symptoms themselves, plus the people who maybe are just beginning to gradually show some changes, plus all the people who have the gene who don't have any symptoms yet. Mm. And kind of moving into the news of, of the last week, it's what's happened is what's been described as a breakthrough that's come out of the UK. So can you tell us how significant this news is? 
Yeah, of course I can. Um, it's a really exciting time for Huntington's disease. And I think actually it goes beyond Huntington's for the field for all the neurodegenerative disorders, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and uh, motor neuron disease and MS and all these kind of different neurological disorders. It's called a gene therapy. So as I mentioned, Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder and kind of an abnormal form. What it does is it produces a protein and we call it the Huntington protein. It's just given that name. When you do this gene therapy, what they do is they actually, they operate on both sides of the brain. They make a burr hole in the skull and they stick a needle down into the brain and they inject the drug. What it does is it tries to block the production of the protein. And so it just means that there's less abnormal protein that's being produced. Not 100%, but it just it leads to a cut down amount of that protein. And so by having less of that protein, what it means is that there's less of this abnormal interaction between proteins. And that means that less brain tissue dies. We have some breaking news to bring you. Huntington's disease has been successfully treated for the first time. According to the results... I've been doing Huntington's disease research and looking after patients with HD for 20 years. And it's unlike anything we've ever seen before. The trial was shown to slow the progress of the disease by 75%. So with me now is our medical editor, Fergus Walsh. So this new treatment described to us what the effects have been. Well, what you would normally see in a person with Huntington's disease in one year is now going to take something like four years, okay? So that's what they're meaning by this decline. It's a decline in the decline of function, right? It's a lessening of the progression of the disease. So that means people will progress more slowly. There are some reports of a person in a wheelchair who's now been able to get out of the wheelchair and doesn't have to use it. There's one report of someone who went back to work after having retired from having Huntington's disease. I don't know the details of these, but I think it's safe to say we should watch this space and see what kind of reports are coming out. So there's a total of 29 patients that are in this first initial uh, report that we heard about. And, you know, it's not very many patients. Normally, in a clinical trial to get a drug approved, you might have at least hundreds, but sometimes thousands of patients. But you can imagine um, for a trial like this where it, it's a therapy that's delivered into the brain, it, it's got to be done in a much more small scale. Why is it then with such a small group of, of patients, of people involved in this trial, why is it so exciting well, I suppose when you, even when you do a small trial, when you see a, a dramatic effect, which is what we've seen here, it still has a lot of impact. It was a remarkably large effect that was found. So they said a 75% slowing in the progression of the disease. Now, once you see something like that, I think everyone feels an obligation to bring that to the community as rapidly as possible. We'll be back in a minute. Any idea of like how long they have been tracking these patients so far and kind of how long they're going to continue to track them for to see, to measure if there's any wane in that, yep. in that effect? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, people have mm. been observed for at least a one-year follow-up after their brain surgery, but some as long as three years. So that's pretty good. They'll be continued at least for five years to be monitored in a very intensive way. And then after a while, they might back down and just do maybe um, more, uh, like maybe less frequent or less detailed monitoring. But they'll probably be tracked, put some of them for the rest of their lives. So there is a need to see the effect in more people. There's also a need to see how this drug continues to affect people. Because I don't think we would see necessarily that people are all of a sudden going to get uh, worse or have a bad side effect. I think that looks pretty promising. There really haven't been any very bad side effects from the drug. 75% is actually quite a huge, quite a huge change. But when you have a huge change like that, sometimes there's a bit of a, a kind of a placebo effect. So people can really be so hopeful. They might have gotten some benefit, but maybe 75% might be a bit of a generous amount. On the other hand, besides those clinical symptoms, the, the thinking and the movement, they also measured these proteins in the body. It's hard to have a placebo effect on those, but it's not impossible, believe it or not. Your body can still produce placebo effects. So 
it's possible that the clinical benefits, they might wane a bit or they might get a bit smaller over time. We really don't know. But even if they dropped by half, it would still be a quite remarkable achievement. So I think we can feel pretty optimistic, but we we have to always be skeptical and try and you know present the most realistic um, situation as possible. Yeah. And so what happens from here? Like how long will it take for this treatment to become available in like Australia, because I'm sure that you've been hearing from people in the community yep. and, and families with this gene and families that are, uh, are suffering from this disease that are, I guess, eagerly awaiting to see when this will be available to them. Right. Well, this is a kind of a complicated part of the story because drug approvals are a country by country process. So, the countries that tend to get drug approval first are those places where the drug is being trialed. And so the U.S. might be first, or it might be in, in Europe somewhere. It's hard to know, but it's no doubt there'll be a very big push to try and get that to happen. Now, for Australia, we have to try and figure out with the company that did this trial, when can we get them to begin to work with the regulators in Australia? And there's sort of two stages for that. In the first stage, it's the TGA or the Therapeutic Goods Administration. They review the existing data and they determine for the Australian population, do they believe that this is safe and well tolerated and it has um, enough benefit that it should be approved? And they may decide it's not enough data or they may decide they'd like to see it a trial run in Australia. It's hard to know, but they what will happen is the company will provide the data to the Therapeutic Goods Administration who will then evaluate it. And that takes months. Um, and they'll, of course, try and expedite it if they can as well because of the significance of this finding. So let's then say for a moment, it, you know, it eventually gets approved by the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia. But the next question is who pays? For it. So it has to then go to the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee for evaluation. They'll look at the kind of value of the treatment to the Australian people to decide how much they can pay and, and what's it worth to the Australian public. You know, they look at it both in terms of the kind of on humanitarian grounds, but also financial grounds. There is a precedent in Australia for gene therapies, which are very expensive to be paid for by the um, through the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. I don't know if any have been at the level of cost that this one's likely to be at, but I would say it's mm. not out of the question. It'll take a while, at least mm. I would say a, couple, a year, a couple of years um, to get it through the processes here. For some people who have Huntington's disease now, this drug is going to come too late and that's really heartbreaking. There might be other people who are either earlier in the disease or maybe they don't have the symptoms yet, they just have the gene. And they maybe, you know, can feel a bit more hopeful that they have a chance that we could get to them. There are so many more questions for us to figure out. Like it could be if you're really early, maybe you benefit the most and maybe you recover something. We don't know. Um, so you have many questions to answer still. This one treatment is not going to be the solution for everyone for many reasons. So. There are other treatments that are also having um, really important effects that are also being trialed right now, some in Australia, and those also have the potential to make a big difference and to be you know, approved in Australia maybe even sooner. So there's a, lot of, lot, there's a lot going on and a lot of different possibilities about how this could look. Well, thank you so much, Julie, for your time and coming on the Morning Edition today. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Tammy. Have a good day. Today's episode of The Morning Edition was produced by Julia Karkatzel. Tom McKendrick is our head of audio. To listen to our episodes as soon as they drop, follow The Morning Edition on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Our newsrooms are powered by subscriptions. So to support independent journalism, visit The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. And to stay up to date, sign up for the Morning Edition newsletter to receive a summary of the day's most important news in your inbox every morning. Links are in the show notes. I'm Tammy Mills and this is the Morning Edition. Thanks for listening. Listener.